Good morning, church. Greetings to you in Jesus' name. Like you're aware, um, all our services are in person at the moment, but for the benefit of those who can't join uh, due to their special circumstances, we're making this recording available to you. Uh, done from my home so that you can keep in touch uh, at what's being taught in your church. Uh, God bless you and keep you as you listen to uh, God's word. Shall we pray? Uh, Father God, I just want to pray for this uh, members of the church who are not able to attend in person due to their special circumstances. I pray, Lord, that they will know uh, you care for them. You are their loving Heavenly Father and uh, you've made it possible for them to have that friendship with you by sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, dying for our sins, buried on the third day, rose again, all in accordance with Scripture, seen by many. You instructed your disciples, you ascended into heaven, you poured out the Holy Spirit upon your church, to remind them that they are the purchased possession of God. Thank you for preparing a place for your church. Thank you that you're coming back for the church and to judge the world. In the meantime, help us, Lord, to know you more, to love you deeper, and to serve you faithfully, even unto that day. Holy Spirit, we ask that you'll open the eyes of our understanding as we sit at the ministry of your word. We ask all this uh, for God's glory and that we might be a blessing to many people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, last week we continued uh, the series of Paul defending himself uh, against uh, these so-called false teachers and super apostles tried to discredit him uh, in the Corinthian church and uh, we looked at 2nd Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Uh, today we're going to do the what we call the next part of that Paul's defense uh, from 2nd uh, Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 to 10. So you can open your Bibles and follow that with me. Uh, last week we looked at the question is it all right to boast at all? And if we are boasting, uh, what should we boast about? We concluded that if you're boasting, we should boast in the Lord. Our content needs to be true and our motives need to be pure. Our motives need to be exclusively for the glory of God and for the building of the church. No room for embellishment just facts uh, and pointing always to Jesus. We also found that when Paul boasted, he was different from all other people who boasted. People who boast usually boast about their strengths, their achievements, etc. etc. Here Paul actually uh, boasts about his weakness and his vulnerability. Uh, we also concluded that ministry, while it might have uh, seasons of fruitfulness and calm, there are also uh, times of trial, and trial uh, refines our faith. So it's good for us when we serve to have a balanced view that you can have both seasons, uh, seasons when everything is going well and things seasons when uh, there are uh, trials. Uh, today we'll be looking at Paul's uh, visions and revelations and uh, we'll also be looking at Paul's thorn in the flesh. So um, uh, as we look today, we will start with verses 1 to 4. Paul says, I must continue to boast. He does this with reluctance. And when he's speaking, he's speaking in the third person. Why does he speak in the third person? Uh, 
because he wants to, he's trying his best to distance himself uh, from attention, uh, but he uh, fails to do so uh, because you'll find in a few verses is he comes clean about his identity. Uh, what do we know about this revelation or the vision that Paul had? Um, firstly, I want to say this is different from the his conversion experience. This is a unique personal experience to Paul. Things that is clear is that he says it was a man, it was a man in Christ, in other words, a Christian, who had this extraordinary experience. He was caught up into the third heavens, into paradise, and he recalls that vividly, and he says this precisely happened 14 years when he was penning this letter. He hadn't spoken about it before, but he feels it's necessary to speak about it. He knows that uh, there's no personal gain for it, but he's looking more for the benefit of the body of Christ at Corinthian Church, so that they will know that Paul uh, is no way inferior to these so-called uh, super apostles or false teachers who are probably boasting about some extraordinary experiences as well. I want to make a comment on the third heavens. In Hebraic thinking, uh, the first heavens is the heavens that you see or the atmosphere. The second heavens is the, uh, the stellar space. And the third space is where, or the third heavens is what they call as the uh, abode of angels and saints. Okay. So, but it's a good principle when the Bible does not make something very clear, uh, then not to speculate or embellish upon it. If God wanted us to know something that's relevant to us uh, at this point in time for our life and godliness, he would make it plain. A question is, like today there are many people who have or who claim that they have got special experiences of going to uh, heaven or etc, etc. And there's a big difference between how they behave and how Paul behaved. If people today who boast of such experiences, they uh, sign book deals and uh, uh, do talk shows and podcasts and other things like that. But Paul, on the other hand, uh, speaks very reluctantly of the experience and he does not disclose uh, all the details because he is not permitted to do so. And frankly, many of the people today who have painted pictures of heaven um, don't seem to tie up with some of the insights and imageries we have from scripture of what heaven is like. Okay, so um, what would you do if you had a personal, uh, unique experience that God has granted you? Remember, it is personal. It is not for public sharing. Then enjoy it and, and uh, uh, hold that dear and uh, keep it to yourself uh, because the personal message is uh, to build you up, uh, not necessarily uh, the body as such. Okay, we look at verses 5 to 7 now. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of his weakness. Again, Paul uh, is uh, wanting to speak about his weakness. And at this point in time, uh, he says, uh, he, it was granted to keep me from being conceited or big-headed. Uh, he was, because of the surpassing greatness of this thorn, uh, God has given me. Uh, a, a thorn in the flesh. This uh, thorn in the flesh is greatly debated about as to what it might be. Uh, some scholars try to speculate and say it was malaria, some people try to speculate and say it was epilepsy, and some something else. Uh, but the reality is 
the Bible does not say what the thorn in the flesh. I would like to suggest uh, three things. Uh, one, uh, the thorn in the flesh was uh, physical, the thorn in the flesh was mental, and the thorn in the flesh was spiritual. Let me explain. I grew up in India, and uh, when I grew up in India, there were times when we went out into the uh, outback, if you like, barefooted at times, and uh, very often uh, we had a, a thorns uh, pierce our feet. And we try and remove the thorn. At times, some of that bit, some of the pointy bit of the thorn still remains in the feet. Believe you me, it is hard to walk when you have got a stake or a thorn uh, in your feet. It's uncomfortable and it can be uh, painful. And it, uh, each time you walk, it constantly reminds you uh, of your frailty and your weakness. So uh, the word uh, thorn, the same word is equivalent to uh, a stake and uh, as in a, something that pierces your body as opposed to a meat stake. Okay, um, so uh, he, it was, uh, it was painful for Paul, whatever this it was. Again, that same principle, when the Bible remains silent on something, it's best for us to be silent, silent rather than to speculate. So again here there was a thorn that was in his flesh and it was painful a uh, reminder of his frailty. I said it was also mental. What do I mean by it's mental? Here because the Bible very clearly says a messenger of Satan uh, to harass me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was a messenger of Satan. You shouldn't be alarmed uh, that Satan could do that to an individual. Remember, uh, you must remember Satan's uh, space and creation and Satan's fate uh, whilst we have new creation. Satan's uh, space and creation, he is a created being, he is an angelic being, and he's a fallen angelic being. And he led a rebellion in which a third of the angels rebelled with him and they fell from the estate and uh, he is an adversary of all God's people. The thing is he's still a created being and he's subject to God. Uh, all things, like Apostle Paul writing the Colossian, the church at Colossae says, all things were created uh, for whether things, or by all things were created in heaven and earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all were created through him and for him. And uh, everything was created by God and it's primarily for his glory. So even Satan is subject uh, to Christ, subject to God. All that he does is doing within uh, his limited scope that God has permitted him to have. And uh, when he buffets a child of God, in this instance, Paul, uh, he does so because he's been granted permission. We've got other stories where uh, Job was uh, buffeted uh, by the adversary. Job didn't even have a clue uh, of what was going on, except that he was going through what he was going through. And another thing we need to remember is uh, his, the current status of the adversary, the space we're talking about. The space of Satan. Colossians again 2.15 it says Jesus he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, shame by triumphing over them. Uh, so that one remember. And Apostle Peter uh, writing uh, to the church he says in 1 Peter 3.22 he says uh, who regarding Christ has gone into heaven is at the right hand of God. Angels, authorities and powers have been subject to him. So uh, keep that in perspective. So that is spa Satan's uh, space. Now a little bit about Satan's uh, fate. Uh, you have got that again. Uh, we will look at Jude 1.6. It says the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority left their proper dwelling 
and was kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment day. So that 2 Peter 2.4 says, He cast them into hell, committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. That picture of chains show that there is a limited movement uh, to the length of the chain, if you like, that imagery is there, and he's, being, he's not being dealt with immediately, but will be dealt with. The church, when uh, displays the wisdom of God, uh, when it wrestles uh, with the unseen forces of darkness. Ephesians 3.10, it says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. In Ephesians 6, 12 says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over the present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly uh, places. So going to that, uh, I said that uh, the thorn in the flesh was physical, it was painful, it was uncomfortable. We also said it was mental. The adversary, uh, a messenger of the adversary was buffeting Paul. And, uh, and we, we also concluded that we shouldn't be alarmed. Anything that the adversary can do to us can only do with the permissive or the permission uh, that God might grant uh, the adversary to do so. And I also think that uh, it may not be necessarily, uh, uh, shouldn't take all the difficulties we face in life as we're being buffeted, which might be the case, which may not be the case. So we need to use uh, absolute discernment when it comes uh, to such things. Talking about uh, the next thing I'd like to say, it is spiritual. In, when, in the fact that I'm saying it is spiritual is the fact that the reason why this was this happened was, it says, uh, to keep fall from being conceited because of the revelation. I'm going to ask you, uh, what would you do if you've been granted some special revelation or a special experience that God has given you? How would you keep yourself from becoming conceited? The important thing to remember uh, who we are and whose we are, and we need to respect our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. So lastly, I want to just touch on verses 8 to 10. Uh, what was Paul's response to this uh, thorn in the flesh, uh, this messenger of Satan that is buffeting him? Uh, what is his response? His response is pray. So I would say to you, if you are feeling buffeted, first thing you do is pray. And just don't pray once and stop. Uh, here Paul prayed three times. It might be literally three times, but it could be several times. It could be an expression to say several times. So you pray and you pray and you pray some more and pray some more um, until uh, God answers, keep praying, keep asking. And here Paul uh, prays, but God answers his prayer in a way that uh, he might have wanted a different answer. Uh, and uh, God answered it differently. God did not remove this messenger uh, that was buffeting him. Instead, God replies, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When we go through such things, Paul, uh, when he's going through this period of trial, which is continuing and continuing and continuing, he does not allow himself to, he keeps praying. He does not go into depression. He does not say, I'm disappointed with you, God. Uh, like sometimes we hear those comments. Uh, he doesn't do any of those things or he doesn't even walk away from God. He is able to gain perspective even in when the prayer is answered differently to how he would have imagined it to be. So I just would like to say, uh, pray that we might gain a perspective uh, when we go through trial so that we can say when I'm weak then I'm strong. Um, gaining that perspective enables you to face all hardships whether it be weakness, uh, insults, uh, persecutions or calamities. Uh, so uh, that's what Paul is saying. So what can we learn from today? I would say that 
Paul is defending himself. This time he's speaking about uh, visions and thorns. Sometimes when God gives grants you special experiences, he also gives you something in order to keep you uh, grounded and uh, not to become proud and conceited. And should you have such wonderful personal experiences with God as you walk with him, uh, discern whether this is uh, just for yourself or it is for sharing. If it is not for sharing, don't share. Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, remember, greater the revelation, uh, greater our human tendency to become proud. And uh, we should not become proud and conceited. So God could make us grounded. And uh, the other thing we looked at was sometimes even God uses the adversary uh, to uh, further the purposes of God. And if, if that is happening in our lives, it's important for us not to become downcast. Instead, we must pray and pray some more and pray some more uh, until God uh, answers you. Keep praying. And uh, if the answer comes in a different way, uh, don't ever think like, oh, I'm disappointed with God. I can't be put up, putting up with this anymore. Don't be like that. Just remember, you can pray this and say, God, may your power be made manifest in my weakness. And that's what exactly what Paul did. So I'm sure in our congregation or any congregation, you'll find there are uh, things that are going really well and things that are trying. There are situations which have been long, uh, it's going on for a long time. In such instances, let's pray that God will grant us perspective and we can pray that God's power will be made manifest in the midst of our weakness. Shall we pray? Uh, Father God, we thank you for the privilege of going through uh, the book of Corinthians. And even as we come towards the tail end of Corinthians, um, Paul is deeply concerned uh, that the church will not be uh, seduced uh, by false teachers, a false gospel, uh, from the simplicity and faithfulness to Christ. Lord, we are saying we want to be uh, faithful to you unto the end. Uh, we thank you for uh, that you met us and included us in your family. We thank you for the many experiences we have had with you. If any of us have had some really close, intimate, personal, unique experiences, help us to discern uh, what to disclose and what not to disclose. Help us to discern that, Lord. We ask, Lord, for those of us who have going through certain struggles, certain trials uh, for a very long period, and it's so easy for us to get downhearted. Grant us perspective. Uh, we resolve in our hearts that we're going to pray and we're going to keep on praying and keep on praying. And even if your, your answer to our prayers is different to how we uh, wanted it to be, we hold to the perspective, Lord, uh, make uh, your power known in the midst of our weakness. We ask this for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and keep you. It's, uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm able to reach out to you in this manner. And if this is beneficial to you, uh, share it with a friend or even why not study during the week uh, further on Meditate on these Scriptures. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again at the earliest uh, uh, possible uh, so that we can meet and fellowship uh, together again. God bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful week.